Well, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to see you all here in the house of the Lord for worship this morning. And for those joining us online, it's a pleasure to have you with us. I just can't see you this morning. So welcome. Glad we could all gather to worship and praise our risen Savior today. Now, as we are gathering for worship, there's just a few matters of announcement and business we need to take care of. One of them is an invite to you. If you are joining us either online or in person, for worship this morning and you aren't a regular part of worship here it'd be great if you'd let us know you are joining with us the way you can do that is if you're in the room there's connection cards in the pews in front of you you can fill those out drop them in the offering boxes after the service or you can contact us online we have a qr code it'll take you to our website where you can find a link to a connection card also online giving that's a great avenue to give and regular support of the church uh, prayer request. We meet weekly for prayer and, and get input on that prayer list and encourage you to be part of that and keep us up to date on things we can be praying for. Also, praises. We want to hear how God is answering prayers in your life as well. And then Right Now Media, which is a great Bible study resource. Uh, if you've got kids or grandkids uh, that you're dealing with as well, there's some great children's material on there. Just uh, it's, it's free. It's a gift from our church to you make use of it sign up for that and make use of it you'll find it to be a blessing for you uh, but all that is available through accessing those qr codes which the qr codes on your screen or you can hit the the um, comments section there's a link there so i want to encourage you to avail yourself of that so please help us out in that regard. Now, some other things going on in the life of the church and on our schedule that you need to be aware of. One is coming up in a few weeks on Wednesday, February the 1st. And yeah, we're just, what, two and a half weeks out from February of 2023. Uh, it's, mm, that doesn't seem real. But here we are. There is a blood drive that will be taking place in our fellowship hall on February the 1st from 3.30 to 7.30. Now, we do these periodically. This time has rolled around again. And so be aware of that. Mark your calendars, February 1st. You may say, well, hey, I want to give blood, but I'm, I'm just here for the men's Bible study, women's Bible study, whatever. Um, hey, you can come earlier. You can schedule a time and come earlier, but... Uh, there is opportunity there, and you'll be seeing posters around about that and whatnot. Now, other things going on in the life of our church that you need to be aware of. We've got a couple things going on today. So you're already here. You can participate. It's great. Uh, one of the first things is, at the well, today we have a special call business meeting at the close of our morning service. So if you are a, a member of the church, now let me explain that. Uh, church membership isn't just I come and I participate. Church membership, you have been uh, baptized as a believer and you have come seeking membership in the church or you have transferred your membership from another congregation to this one in an official capacity. That's what distinguishes a voting member from everyone else. Now, everyone's welcome to come worship with us. You're welcome to become a Sunday school class member and, and be involved in the various ministries and activities of the church. But for voting purposes on business of the church, then that's, that's a little different thing. So that call business meeting at the end of the service this morning, uh, that you'll need to be a member to vote. And if you're not a member and you're thinking, I don't want to hang around for that, that's okay. We'll pause at the end of our worship service so that you can slip out and, you know, beat everybody else to lunch uh, while we take care of that business. But, and I'll come back and, and mention that in a moment. But our regular monthly business meeting is also at 3 o'clock this afternoon. It's usually at 5.30. It's now at 3. So be aware of that. Now, for the close of service today, the matter of business we are taking, ca uh, taking care of is a proposed amendment to our Constitution and bylaws. And some rules in our Constitution govern that. One, you have to be a voting member. Two, we have to have a quorum present. That's 15% of our uh, resident active membership. That works out to about 42 people. And at least 42 voting members have to be present. And we have to have an affirmative vote of three-fourths of the members present because this involves a change to the Constitution. Now, if it's just bylaws, it'd be two-thirds, but it's a constitution and bylaws, so it goes up to the next level, which is a three-fourths vote. 
So be aware of those. The way we're going to handle that is at the end of the service. Ballots will be made available to you. They simply say yes or no. Pretty straightforward. Yes, I'm in favor of the change. No, I'm not in favor of amending it. And you'll turn those in. The deacons will tally those. And we will get the results of that at our business meeting at 3 o'clock this afternoon. So do want to keep you aware of that. It's not a time for discussion or debate or anything else. It's strictly a yes or no vote by ballot. So be aware of that happening at the end of the service. If you're a member, I encourage you to hang around for that. Uh, and again, church business meeting today at 3 o'clock. I uh, would refer you to the messenger on that. Uh, we have some big business. I've mentioned it already. Uh, that is that we have a proposal coming forward to list the church property for sale. And we'll have a time of that being presented and then discussion. There will not be vote on that today. That'll take place in a couple weeks at the close of a morning service. But we want to give everybody a time to ask questions and to discuss this and then pray about it uh, in a, over the next couple weeks. So we'd like you to be involved in that. So three o'clock today in the fellowship hall. Come be part of that. Huh. Well, that was a lot, wasn't it? And that's the end of my announcements. So let's get on to the business we're here for, and it's the important business of worshiping our Lord. So join me as we turn our hearts and our minds towards Christ this morning in worship. Join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, this morning as we are gathered in this place, Lord, our desire is to worship you, to bring what we have and who we are before you, as an act of worship, to glorify you. And Father, we ask that you would take us and use us for your kingdom. That our words and our actions would be something that point others to you and bring glory to your name. And Lord, as we gather in this time, oh, we have an order of service, we have a plan for the service, but Father, we ask that you would lead us by your spirit this morning to truly worship you, each one of us. Not to just go through the motions of a service, but to worship you wholeheartedly. Father, lead us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Indeed, we're here to worship, worship our Lord alone, the Ancient of Days the great God of our salvation. We begin today's service by singing How Majestic Is Your Name. Let's stand, please, oh, and join together as we sing. <coughs> oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh. 
our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of His might, oh, sing of His grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space. Mysterious of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills all the dew and the rain. Frail children, song we sing is the one we introduced it's been a while it's a pre-covid song but i expect you to remember it just like it was yesterday how about that this is you alone and the song uh, is a very simple uh, uh, melody you'll pick up on it right away uh, you alone You are the only one I need. I bow all of me at your feet. I worship you alone. You have given me more than I could ever have. Wanted and I want to give you my heart and my soul. You alone are Father, and you alone are good. You alone are Savior, and you. The only one I need, I bow all of me at your feet, I worship you alone. You have given me more than I could ever have wanted and died. To give you my heart and my soul. You alone are Father, and you alone are God. You alone are Savior, and you alone are God. You are the only one. 
your feet I worship you alone. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. In just a moment, we'll sing a new, a new song, actually, one that you've not done before, perhaps, at least not here refers to our God being the Ancient of Days. And so our scripture passage today is that passage from Daniel that introduces that notion of God being before all things, after all things, the Ancient of Days. This is from Daniel chapter 7. Uh, it's a rather lengthy couple of verses, and then I'll, you'll join in and read the gold text when that comes up. From Daniel chapter 7, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. What a great truth and prophecy that is. This new song, Ancient of Days. Um, once again, you'll catch on to this quite quickly. rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all, so I will not fear, for his truth remains, that my God is the Ancient of Days. None before him, none before him, all of time in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name. For my God is the Ancient of Days. Though the dread of night overwhelms my soul, who is here with me? I am not alone. Oh, His love is sure, and He knows my name. God is the Ancient of Days. None above Him, none before Him, all of time in His hands. For His throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, in his name, for my God is the Ancient of Days. Though I 
Just the name is power, breath and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. In storytelling, writing, even in gaming, and as I look around the room, I see many of you that are probably computer gamers, right? 
and no, okay, one, maybe two, three, okay, good. Yeah, so I know there are a few out there. In all of those genres, there's this thing called world building. And when you're building a world, what you're doing is you're creating an environment in which people begin to, to mentally understand things. They start to fit together, how the pieces of the story go together. There's some background and there's some things along those lines. Well, I want to do a little story building or world building with you today. I want to tell you about a king in a far off land, and it was long ago. And this king in this far off land long ago ruled over a nation of people. But he was faced with a problem. Communication was limited. It was pretty much a face-to-face -face or by, by letters being sent. And his kingdom was large enough that for him to actually travel out to every village and every place within his kingdom, well, it just wasn't practical. He would never be in the capital to make those governing decisions and to lead the military and whatnot. And so to rectify this problem and to give the members, the citizens of his kingdom, an idea of who he is, not just hearing his laws as they are sent out and read, but instead being able to go, that's my king. To have a king that should they ever encounter him in passing would be able to recognize him. That when others asked, they could say, that's our king. What the king did was he had his artisans in the capital craft statues of himself, images, likenesses of himself, and he had those sent out to the various communities and places in his kingdom. So that he had just what he was looking for. So that the people that lived there could go, that's my king. And when people visited the town and says, who rules over this place? They could say, that guy, that's him. Now that may sound like some sort of a fairy tale. The reality is that's history. That was common history in, well, the early Mesopotamian world. The kings during that time would send out images of themselves to the communities over which they reigned, a statue, an image, so that people could look at it and acknowledge that's the king. It is into that framework that we find the account of Genesis 1 coming into place. If you join me, we're going to be everywhere from Genesis to well, one of the R books towards the end of the Bible. Oh, hang on. There, maybe that'll help. We're going to be in Genesis, but we're going to wind up over in Romans towards the end. In Genesis chapter 1, I would hope you're acquainted with the creation account. And I, we actually got into a discussion of this with the youth uh, a few weeks ago when we were discussing Genesis. And, and they were saying, well, okay, seven literal days, or is it figurative days? Or it, and I said, oh, you're missing the point. So the point of Genesis is found in Genesis 1. 1. In the beginning, what's that next word? Come on, you know it. God. Yeah. There's the point of Genesis. If, if you want to get hung up on all the other stuff and argue about it, knock yourself out. Just don't do it here. And agree on one thing. In the beginning, God created. It is the work of his hand. Well, we're going to jump to day six in the Genesis account from Genesis 1. Genesis 1, verse 20, hmm, let's see, let's start with 24. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. 
God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kind, all the creatures moved along the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us, and yes, us, who's us? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all of the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Hmm. God created humanity, distinct and separate from all of the rest of creation. In fact, we're going to get into the mechanics of it in a little bit. But how, in what way did God create humanity? What did he say? Then God said, let us make mankind, and it stops there. No. Let us make mankind in our image. Folks, humanity has a lot of problems. Most of them we have created for ourselves. We would love to blame the devil. The devil facilitated some of it, but we chose it. Sin eats away at individuals and at humanity. Scripture tells us we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there is still something about us from the moment of our creation that speaks to the king of all glory. That points and says, he is king. Now we may not like that. We may shy away from that. We may want to argue there is no king in our humanity. But the truth is, our very humanity declares the image of God. And when we look at one another, we need to be reminded that we are looking at not only God's handiwork, not only someone who was created because God loved them and desired them to be, but because they are also carrying the image of God. Now there's lots of discussions over what is the image of God? Is it our capacity to love? Is it our, our intellect? Are we, are we in some way some sort of a triune being, you know, body, soul, and spirit? Or, or, you know, what is it that is the image of God reflected in us? Well, I think it's in part our maleness and our femaleness. In part, it is our personalities and our emotions. In part, it is our reason and our rationale, our ability to think, our ability to choose, our ability to be morally aware, our ability to reflect the Father, to be a vessel for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ living in us. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give to you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. Now some of you may latch on to that, especially the younger generations and go, oh, we're all supposed to be vegetarians. No, keep reading until you finish the Noah account. Because God tells Noah to have a barbecue. I, he calls it a sacrifice, but then eat the barbecued meat. So, yeah. Um, so don't read too much into that, except God provided. 
And he set up an order to his creation that humanity was to reflect the image of God. And all of creation speaks of his glory and his order and his provision. And God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And then we shift gears a little bit. We have an overview of creation up to that point. But starting in verse 4 of chapter 2, we have a different approach to the creation story. We focus in on humanity. In verse 4 it says, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. And there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. That's a little more detail than we got in chapter 1, isn't it? Still, man is created in the image of God, and that's mankind, created in the image of God. And then when we get into the details, how was man formed? By God taking the dust of the earth and forming it and breathing life into it. All the rest of creation is spoken into existence. But with the creation of humanity, God got his hands dirty and breathed life into us. Folks, that's significant. There is something deeply personal about our creation. It is one thing to just direct something far off to be done. It's another to get personally involved. Now, God was personally involved in all of creation. He spoke every bit of it into existence. But with humanity, it was more than just speaking into existence. It was an investing of himself. What is it to carry the image of God? What is it to be that special relationship creation that God made us to be. Our world, in short, doesn't know. Because it is not something that we experience in our native state. Because we are sinners and we have a bent towards sin, our nature is warped in the direction of sin. You may say, well, yeah, if we keep reading it, it was all Eve's fault, right? She's the one that talked to the serpent, and she's the one that that ate the fruit, and then she gave it to Adam. Remember that story? Yeah, so it's her fault, right? I'll remind you, where was Adam in the story? He was right there with her. At no point did he speak up and go, no, we don't need to listen to this talking snake. I mean, come on, it's a snake. And no, we don't need to eat this fruit. He's like, oh yeah, sure. He is on board for this whole thing. And we can say, oh yeah, it's all Adam and Eve's fault. But the truth is, every one of us has chosen to rebel against God. Every one of us has chosen to do things our own way. To play the role of God in our own lives instead of following Him and acknowledging Him. Even though we were created to reflect His image in this world, We reflect a warped image of God until we reach that point of brokenness of spirit, that point where we surrender ourselves 
to him. That point at which we acknowledge he is king and he is God and we are not. And then something changes. We not only begin to reflect God in a clearer way, but we grow to more and more resemble him. Romans 12 talks to us about being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Scripture talks to us about being conformed to the image of Christ. Folks, the more we grow in our relationship with Christ, the more we become what we were created to be. Now, we reflect God, again, from the moment of our creation, but we do it clearer and clearer the more we grow in Christ. Now, our world has a huge problem. As we look at Romans, the first chapter, I want to start in verse 16. Because all of this, reflecting the image of God and us carrying that image and needing to reflect it clearly to show people who God is, it speaks to the gospel because this isn't like there's different segments of the bible and they talk about different things folks the bible is pointing towards redemption found in christ from the beginning to the end in romans 1 16 it says for i and this is paul talking but he says for i am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. If we are going to not be ashamed of the truth of God the good news of God, that he is redeeming and saving the lost. If we are going to start reflecting the image of God and do it clearly, we cannot be ashamed of the gospel. and We need to understand that we live in righteousness with God, not I do all the right things, look how good a person I am, but uh, I am redeemed and God has made me righteous person. Going on in verse 18, it says the wrath of God. Here's that huge problem I was talking about. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their, with their wickedness, by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, remember we just talked about that. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen. Folks, the world has seen who the king is. He placed his image among us. All of creation declares his glory. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. In other words, humanity, our history as humanity, is that even though God has been revealed throughout creation, the stuff you can't see about God, you can see about God in his handiwork. And part of that being the image of God being present around us. All of that has gone on. And yet humanity hasn't wanted to see it. 
although they know God, although they can acknowledge those things are there, we would rather compromise for the cheap imitation. I've shared with you before the story from C.S. Lewis, and it's just a little uh, kind of anecdotal tale. He talks about the offer of the gospel and the offer of a right relationship with God is to many people like going to a child that lives in the countryside that has never been to the coast for, uh, I'm going I'm to make this Americanized, he says for a holiday, for vacation, and offering them a trip to the coast. And them turning it down because they can't imagine anything being more fun than the mud puddle that they are playing on the edges of. They have no frame of reference for something more. Folks, we're given that frame of reference. All of humanity, all of creation is shown God. But we can't wrap our heads around him. And so in our sinfulness, in our rebellion, we start to worship other stuff. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Folks, God made himself known. And humanity took what God had made known to them and said, yeah, I don't get this God thing. I'm not sure I want this God thing. So I'm going to make a statue and make it look like a man. And I'm going to worship that. Or a bird. Hey, they fly. Or a lizard. Because I I don't know why anybody would want to worship a statue of a lizard. But, you know, lizards are cool, but who looks at a lizard and goes, oh, I want to worship that. The point is, humanity looked at creation and said, yeah, there's something out there to worship. I'm going to make it this piece of creation. Instead of looking a little bit higher and saying, I'm going to worship the God of all creation who has made himself known through his creation, who set his image in the midst of his creation and said it is very good. God created us for a relationship with him. God created us to know him and to love him. And in our sinfulness, we rebelled and we needed a savior. And God took care of that too. The gospel that Paul says, I am not ashamed of, is that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. That we have earned the wages of our sin, which is death and eternal separation from God. But that God loves us so much and desires that relationship with us so much that in spite of the fact that none of us deserve it, He died in our place on the cross to pay the price for my sin and your sin and the sins of the world so that we could turn to him accepting that forgiveness that atonement for our sin and know him and worship him and be in a relationship with him not a relationship of i'm worshiping this object over there or this this being over there but we get to have a relationship that has the very presence the very spirit of god living in our lives the god of all creation dwelling in that part of his creation that he said would be his image That's when we are what we were truly created to be in relationship with God, reflecting his presence to the world. 
And folks, as believers and followers of Christ, we are called to reflect that presence, to not be ashamed of that gospel, but to declare to the world what God has done for us, what he is doing in us, and what he desires to do for every sinner lost in their sin. Be the image of God reflecting who God is to the world that needs to know him because they've settled for everything else. And they've missed what matters. We have the message of salvation. We have that relationship with the Father. We bear the image of God, not just because we were created in His, in his image, but because we were created in His image and we carry His Spirit. Live lives that glorify Him. Make Him known. Now, if you're in the room today, or you're joining us online, and you're saying, well, okay, I get that whole image of God, sort of, but that whole Spirit of God living in me thing, that whole forgiveness for sin things, I'm, I, I, I'm not there. You're talking about needing a Savior. I don't know how to do that, but I know I need one. Then let me share this with you. God has invited you to turn to Him and find salvation. Just turn to Him. You say, but I don't know the right words. You don't have to. But you know the words that are on your heart. And you can talk to God. Turn to Him. Use your own words. But talk to Him and cover three basic areas. The first one, admit to God that you're a sinner. Get it out there. You know it, He knows it, but get it out there. Admit to God that you're a sinner in need of forgiveness. And then turn to him asking to be forgiven. Asking to be made right with him and have that right relationship with him. Scripture talks about that. The New Testament talks about calling on God and being saved. Talks about Christ dying for our sins so that we don't have to die in our sins. So ask him to forgive you believing he can and does. And then commit yourself to follow him as Lord of your life, as the king ruling over you, to turn from trying to be king in your own life, to repent from how you did live and who you were, and turn towards who God is calling you to be as you follow him. So in talking to God, use your own words, but cover those areas. Admit to him your sin. Ask Him to forgive you, believing He can and does, and follow Him with your life. And the promise of Scripture is that He saves us. He saves us from our sin, and not only that, but He gives us His very presence, the Spirit of Christ dwelling in our lives, so that it's not all on us. But the Holy Spirit works in us. When I talked about us being conformed to the image of God, when I talked about us looking more and more like Christ, that is the work of His Spirit in our lives, drawing us closer and closer to Him. Do you need to take that step today? If you do, I want to invite you, turn to God in prayer. And after you do that, if you're joining online, reach out to us. You can do that email, phone call, whatever. Reach out to us or reach out to other believers in your life, folks that know God's word and follow him with their life and share with them that decision. If you're in the room with us, we're going to have a song of commitment and, and a time of commitment. And during that, I'll be down here at the front. If God is moving in your heart and you've turned to him today, I want to invite you, come down. I want to talk with you. I want to pray with you. We want to celebrate what God is doing in your life today. Will you let us do that? come during this time. Let me lift you in prayer. Heavenly Father, we turn to you today acknowledging that you are our King and our God. Acknowledging that you are the God of all creation and you made us. And Father, we don't claim to understand all the ins and outs of it. 
but you've made it abundantly clear that you love us and you desire us to show your presence. So Father, we pray that you would take us and use us again for your glory. Even as we prepare to go out from this place, that as we go about our lives and we interact with those in the world around us, Father, that we would reflect your image and we would not be ashamed of your gospel. Father, give us boldness. Strengthen those that are turning to you. Surround them with brothers and sisters in Christ that can walk with them and help them to grow in their faith and their obedience to you. And Lord, we thank you for the Savior that you have given us. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand now as we sing our prayer and our commitment to the Lord, asking him to change our hearts. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. seated.